I cannot believe that. We back again. Step down the lane. Drop it inside to Oubre. What a delivery by Curry. Jokic springs free. And a dunk from Nikola Jokic. Who's faster, you or Luka? Oh, it's a dead race. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. I can't do it because if it's not music, you know I can't do it. Oh, I could dance a little bit. I got some rhythm. Brown again? You bet. Oh, a little shimmy. Look like Bruce Brown just looked he up just at the scoreboard how many and saw he had 29 had? points. Yeah. They was like, why you ain't get 30? I was like, bro, I didn't know. <laughs> Lost it up by one. Doncic, the handles. Sometimes it's like playing the chess. You, know? you got to take your time and see the moves. Doncic, down to three seconds, two seconds. Doncic for the win. Oh, yeah! Luka Doncic, the dagger! Welcome to The Jump. I'm Rachel Nichols, and this is The Jump's scheduled release special. We have an array, a veritable plethora of guests joining us today, including Woj, Richard Jefferson, Matt Barnes, Jackie McMullen. They're going to break down all the best matchups and storylines from the second half of the season. Also coming up later in this show, who are the biggest all-star snubs? Everyone's favorite conversation the day after the rosters are announced. Matt Barnes and RJ are going to join me to discuss that. And remember, if you are adding someone, you have to replace someone who's already in. Those are going to be the rules. First, though, let's get to some second half schedule highlights. Here we go. Starting with the NBA on ABC Slate on April 4th. It's Lakers Clippers in a potential Western Conference Finals preview right here in L.A. And then on April 10th, it's going to be Lakers at Nets. Woo, we all want to see that one. Nets won the first matchup earlier this season. But remember, no Anthony Davis or Kevin Durant, so hopefully both teams will be at full strength by then. Now, over on April 17th, we have Warriors Celtics. Steph Curry averaging 30 this season. Can the Celtics dynamic duo of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum show him down? Tune in and find out for that. On April 24th, the Lakers visiting the Dallas Mavericks. LeBron versus Luka in a matchup that is sure to have some playoff implications. So lock in for that one. And on May 2nd, it's the Nets against the Bucks. You may recall back on January 18th, these teams played one of the best games of the season. Just nonstop back and forth buckets. So that should be another good one. And we can take a look at some notable games on the ESPN slate as well in the second half. March 17th. We have Clippers-Mavs in a playoff rematch. April 14th, we have a Nets-Sixers matchup. Teams, of course, currently atop the Eastern Conference. April 25th, it's Celtics-Hornets. Could this be a Gordon Hayward revenge game? We also have rematches of both conferences and finals matchups from last season coming to you in May. All right, at this time, I'd like to welcome in our senior NBA insider, Adrian Wojnarowski. Good to have you back on the show. And Woj, we've never talked about a regular season schedule that goes well into May, but here we are. There have been a lot of postponements in the first half of the season as well, with the Spurs being the most recent team to go through it. So what is the league's plan for makeup games in the second half? Well, the Spurs, Rachel, and Memphis, they're going to play 40 games in the second half. They're scheduled to play 40 games. Uh, the Washington Wizards, who also lost a number of games of postponements in the first half, they'll play 38. And remember, they were able to make up a few of them already uh, because they had their trouble earlier than Memphis and San Antonio. Uh, but as we get into that second half, if there are postponements and if other teams get hit, you know, you're looking at the possibility the league won't be able to make up all of those games uh, before the playoffs. They don't want to push back the start of the playoffs or the finals. They want to keep it on schedule. So they're at the mercy in the second half of, of how COVID hits and, and how many games they may lose uh, in that window. Yeah, and look, they've got that looming deadline of the Olympics, right? They don't want to go up against the Olympic Games. They want their players to at least be available for the Olympic Games. So it is important they try to stay on point from here on out. And I mentioned the Spurs before. They're among the teams that have more than half their games scheduled for the second half. So uh, what do you think they are going to do? Do you think that maybe, hey, not every team's going to play 72 games. Will we get to that point? It's certainly possible, Rachel. And, you know, we had that last year 
when the season stopped. Some teams had played more than others going into the bubble, you know, and win percentage became uh, the criteria for the postseason. I, I think for Memphis, uh, as they try to integrate a healthy Jaron Jackson here at some point in the second half back in, without real practice days, all of these teams, especially, you know, Memphis, San Antonio, but really as you move down, almost no teams are going to have two days off. You're going to have your back-to-backs, but you're going to be playing really every other day. And, and you talk to teams and, you know, certainly the – uh, concern about that, but also how travel will change. Where, you know, in the past, in a, in a schedule that's built out uh, in a traditional manner, you might go, we're going to play in Dallas, and then we travel to Oklahoma City, and you might move around in an orderly way. I think what you're seeing in this schedule are teams bouncing around more geographically, and you don't get an extra day off going west to east as you might. And so the toll that's going to take, certainly on players, uh, it's taken a great toll already mentally all of the things in place um, with COVID and the restrictions and I think there's a lot of concern about uh, overtaxing players as they continue just to grind through games uh, the mental impact this is having and what it's going to do to the quality of play and I think those are all concerns as the NBA tries to get in as many games as they can here uh, before the postseason. Yeah and, and look I want to sneak in a question to you about All-Star but I will say this I really love this second half of the schedule release. I know it was made, you know, it, it, it had to be this way because of coronavirus. But I think it's given the league, when you look over the schedule, it's given them the opportunity to juice some matchups. Do you get any sense, Woj, that this could be something that we do from now on, even in non-COVID times? It's a good question. I, I haven't heard that as um, a scenario that I follow. I do think one thing that we've seen because of COVID that I do think you may see in future schedules are the two-game homestands or two-game right. road trips in a city. Yeah. It's one thing when you come to New York or L.A. and there's two teams and you can stay there and play, stay in town for a few days because you can play the Lakers or Clippers or Knicks or Nets. Uh, but when teams can go in and play two games in a city, have a day off between, uh, and which is a little more like baseball scheduling, I do sense a lot of... Um, uh, feeling around the league that they'd like to see that continue in the future. That's a great note. It's really given us some good grudge matches, too. Something happens in that first game of the two-part home span. We, we don't have to wait months to see what happens. These guys get right back on the court right. a couple nights later. It's so fun. It's going to be our next campaign on the jump. Two halves of the schedule from now on so we can get juicier matchups in the second half. I do want to ask you about All-Star real quick, Woj. Playing some sound from Paul George about All-Star. This was after he was named a reserve last night. Take a listen. I'm just not a fan of it. Um, with, with everything going on, um, you know, I, I think it's just smart. No, the league has done it. Um, and I get, we, we have an amazing league. Um, I'm not discrediting that, but I don't think it's just in the middle of a pandemic. It's something that needs to be had. Um, especially, you know, personal reason I got fined for, um, spending time with a teammate, um, for having a teammate over and yet we have this all-star game. So. Again, I got uh, personal reasons why I disagree with the game, but I've been selected um, and I'll be there to, uh, you know, uh, to to play for the fans, uh, whatever fans that are there. So, Woj, we know the All-Star game is happening, right? All these players have spoken their minds. The game is going to go forward. So how is the league handling or balancing all these concerns? Well, I mean, Listen, as you said, Rachel, they're going to play the game. They negotiated it with the Players Association, uh, who agreed that under these provisions, get them in and out in 24 hours, private planes in and out uh, for players into Atlanta. Uh, no real, um, you know, not have to have the traditional All-Star weekend. Uh, I just think for a lot of teams, uh, and especially as you look at that schedule, coming back on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, it feels, and you talk to teams, it feels like it's not an all-star break. It's just a bit of a long weekend, and this is all going to blur into one, one season, not a first half, second half. Washington's a good example. Uh, you know, they finish on the 4th. They've got to be in Memphis on the 8th because you got to test two days prior to your first game. Wow. And so, you know, it's really three days off. Yeah.
Yeah, that is really putting into perspective. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Woj. We will see you soon. And guys, remember Thanks, at the top of the show, we broke down some of the biggest matchups coming up in the second half of the season as our schedule release special continues. I'm going to welcome in a couple of NBA champs, Richard Jefferson, Matt Barnes. Starting with Richard, how much should head-to-head -head matchups factor into the MVP race down the stretch, my friend? Well, I, I think it should matter. I think a lot of things matter. I think the head-to-heads are something that we get excited about. We want to see uh, players pair up. A, a, again, last year when LeBron James was kind of closing that gap on Giannis, a lot of people pointed to uh, the wins versus Milwaukee, the wins versus the Clippers. Conversely, when Giannis was starting to build his narrative in December, I think it was mainly because he had beat the Clippers and it beat the Lakers. So I think these head-to-head -head matchups, they matter, but I don't think it, they should count towards. Ultimately, it's the, a lot of times it's the best player on the best team or someone that's having a historic season. I think obviously, a lot, I think Richard hit on the head, it's more for the fans. We love these matchups when you can get star against star, especially guys that are at the top of the MVP race. But I, obviously it's the body of work, but to me I would just love, and I know we've talked about this before, I would love for it to expand to through the playoffs mm -hmm. because I'm tired of seeing MVPs take their team to the first or even second round. To me, MVPs is a guy you can go to down the stretch and a guy that's going to take his team hopefully to the conference finals but or to the NBA finals. So I wish they would just expand um, you know, make it the entire season, not just the regular season. Well, you know, I have a platform of awards reform, <laughs> Matt Barnes, but I, there are a lot of people who feel that this should be something that goes through the playoffs. Now, that, of course, might discount the regular season more, which is something the NBA doesn't want because they want people to buy tickets for those games when people could eventually be back. But there are discussions about do we have the right awards? RJ, you know my thing. I think that the MVP should be for who the best player in the league is. And if someone does put up historic offensive numbers or stats for that season, they should get rewarded with a separate award, which is what every other major pro U.S. sports league does. That being said, if you did it that way, or maybe even in the current system, do you think that a star with two other stars on his team, and this year it is Kevin Durant with the Nets, before it was any of the Warriors, K KD, Steph, Clay, right, Draymond, those guys. Do you think if you up to three superstars, you can win the MVP? I don't think so. I, I, I you know, I think you go back in history, I feel like Magic Johnson might have done it. I feel like Larry Bird. Uh, but how many players have really won it with three superstars? You could say Michael Jordan did it with Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman on his team. But if you're talking about three offensive weapons, three offensive stars where you had in Golden State, uh, you had uh, in Miami, I, I, I truly believe, uh, with D. Wade, Chris Bosh, even though Chris Bosh took a lesser role, uh, I, I think it's very, very difficult to, to make that MVP because on a lot of given nights, like we're talking about James Harden it should be in the conversation, but a lot of it has to do with, with him stepping up in the absence of uh, Kevin Durant, who is probably the best player on their team. So it just becomes very, very difficult when guys are alternating, dominating, uh, when you have three players of that caliber. Agreed. Again, uh, you know, Richard hit it on the head. It, it, it's tough when you have three go-to stars on the offensive end because these guys take turns, uh, you know. So normally if you have one or two guys, you know those one or two guys, AD and LeBron have to go every single night. With Brooklyn's situation, you have the luxury of, unfortunately, not having Kevin Durant for a little while and the team doesn't really miss a beat. So it's tough when you have three guys, three alphas on the offensive end to, you know, really determine whether they're MVP worthy or not. But at the same time, when you have three superstars, the goal should be championship, not MVPs. Right. And look, I know fans kind of can get upset if they feel like the stars on their team were, quote, discounted. Like a lot of the Warriors fans are like, wait, if that was the rule for our guys, it should be the rule for the Nets. There's no rule, obviously. It's what individual <laughs> voters decide is important to them. And there's a real cross section making up that voting pool. That being said, if you look at the voting results over the years, the tipping point for voters seems to be between those two and three stars. Two stars on a team, Scotty and MJ, you know, we can go example after example. They will vote for one of those guys. Having a second big star doesn't seem, at least historically, to put off voters. It's once you get to three or maybe even four big stars on the team, that's where it breaks down. And we just haven't right. seen voters reward guys who are in that situation. We will see, though, how that second half of the schedule lays out for the Nets and whether any of their guys 
come to the fore. We'll keep talking about the schedule later in the show. We're also going to show you Luca's game winner from last night. The Mavs back at 500 on the season. Whether they are going to take a second half sprint here, we'll look at their new schedule. All right, let's talk all-star reserves, friends. We're going to start in the Eastern Conference. Named last night a good mix of returning guys, but a few new faces. Zach Levine, Julius Randle, Jalen Brown. Per usual, there was an uproar afterward about snubs, Richard, snubs. I don't want no snubs. So I'll start with you. Who belongs on the squad that didn't get the nod? But remember, if you add someone in, you must take someone's name off the board. Go. Nikola Vucevic does not belong Ooh. on that team. Uh, I think it needs to be Sabonis. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that, that Vucevic isn't great. His team is just not performing at a level, and a lot of times we use that against players. Sure. But then you go and look at Sabonis. His numbers are great. And then you go and look at his team. His team is playing well. They traded players. They traded out Victor Oladipo. They bring in Karis LeVert. Karis LeVert is not playing with the team. And all he did was step up and put them in the fourth place fourth place in the Eastern Conference. And we're not talking about one of those like, 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 oh, we're just okay. They're literally playing quality basketball with a brand new coach, and he is doing a great job. I think he belongs. He should have got it over Vucevic. Hmm. That's a good take. Um, you know, they're rewarding <laughs> teams that are, have, have their team in position. And obviously, you know, Sabonis has had a great season. You look at Bam, who's playing well. You look at Trey Young, who's having 27 points. But these guys, if I'm not mistaken, the only person who made the all-star team out of the East that's team is not in playoff contention right now is Bradley Beal. And we all know what kind of season he's having. So, you know, I, I see where Richard is at with that Vujovic and Sabonis. But overall, it's hard for me to take anyone outside of uh, – Vujovic off that roster and replace him with someone else as we're going by Rachel's rules. <laughs> Not just, I mean, again, meta, this is physics. You cannot jam an extra human on there unless you take a human out. Right. I am just <laughs> saying. All right, right, I want to move on to the West. Mostly vets yeah. with guys like CP3, Damian Lillard, who should have been in the starter. Anyway, uh, Paul George, Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert, Zion, the only first-time All-Star here. Now, Anthony Davis got the nod. He's unlikely to play due to injury. But that means, do we get Devin Booker right on there? Matt, where do you lie on this? The commissioner gets to pick who the injury substitution should be. I think 100% it should be Devin Booker. Um, again, a nice list. It's hard to remove anyone else, but Devin Booker's having a great year uh, with his running mate CP3. Have his team, probably the biggest surprise team of the year. They're sitting at fourth place in the Western Conference, 10 games over 500. And I just love the kind of basketball they're playing. So like LeBron said, Devin Booker has consistently been looked over, and uh, the commissioner should definitely do the right thing and hand that nod to Devin Booker. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Now, again, this is where you're fortunate, where we don't have to take somebody off because we know Anthony Davis is not playing. Yep. Uh, but I, I, I think this is more of a credit to Chris Paul. Right, The minute Chris Paul got on that team, even though Devin Booker is putting up great numbers, which he has done for multiple years in his career, cracking the All-Star game last year, I think you look at it and you're like, well, the only reason why they're truly in fourth place is because Chris Paul brought a level of calm, security, veteran leadership. So that's why he was an All-Star in OKC last year. That's why he's an All-Star this year. People are giving him the credit for the success for the Suns and not Devin Booker. But I think Devin Booker will get it with Anthony Davis uh, uh, sitting out the All-Star game. That's a great point because when you say people are giving him credit, it's the coaches, right? The coaches yeah. are the ones who pick the reserves and coaches love vets. So, yep. yeah, I am not surprised it fell that not way. All coaches, not all coaches love vets. <laughs> It's secure coaches, coaches that are secure. Insecure <laughs> coaches don't like vets because they because because vets know the real uh, from the fake. So secure coaches like them. I think you that might does. be mixing that up. It's that coaches didn't like you when you were a vet, Richard. I, I don't that, know if we expand that out to everyone. Seven, <laughs> seven, 17 years, right? Like, like, you know, 17 <laughs> years. I was doing something right. <laughs> Absolutely. Many, many things right. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep bragging on you because we only put that little thing up in the corner. This man has been in four. Four NBA Finals. <laughs> hey, hey, Just I, 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 I had good teammates. Yeah, but, See, but I give them all the credit. Mm -hmm, Just like Chris Paul mm -hmm. deserves a lot of that credit. They gave 110 percent. All right, coming up, the Celtics have two All Stars, but they are currently under 500 of this, on the season. Do you question whether those were deserved All Star nods? Jackie McMullen is going to join us next. We're going to discuss more of the schedule here on the Jump. The Hall of Famer, Jackie McMullen. And Jackie, we learned yesterday both Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum earned all-star reserve spots, which makes the Celtics the only team 
currently under 500 to have multiple all-stars. Brown discussed why he doesn't quite right. feel like an all-star despite averaging 25 points per game on the season. Let's take a quick listen. Doesn't don't feel very much like an all-star because uh, I think this is the most um, I've lost since I've been here as a Celtic and we got to find ways to win. And I still think we've been playing better than we have earlier in the season. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll string some games together and make a run. Like it, it's very much in our grasp to do so. Um, it's just a matter of time. All right. Now, Jason Tatum expressed similar thoughts during his media availability. So, Jackie, what do you think looking at this team from above here? I know inside they might not feel like they're worthy, but do you question the Celtics getting two all-star spots? I don't. And that clip that you just played of Jalen Brown makes me think he's an all-star even more because he's caring about the team right now instead of an individual honor that someday he'll be really, really happy about. Hmm. There's a lot of things wrong with the Boston Celtics, Rachel. Uh, two of them are not Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown. Hmm. They're in the top 15 in scoring, both of them. And you were talking before about what coaches look for when they pick all-star reserves. They like vets. They also like players that are two-way players. And yep. that's both what Brown and Tatum have been from the beginning of their careers. And they're just, each of them are getting better and better that this year. Marcus Smart will help when he comes back, but Kemba is not Kemba. We've, we've talked about that ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. You know, they need a big wing that can defend. They need someone that can facilitate. They need someone can pass the ball more for them and someone that can work off the dribble. And you know what they need? They need Gordon, Gordon Hayward. Hayward. Guy that <laughs> As you're awesome. describing that, I was like, yeah. wait, they had one of those. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they did have one of those. Yeah, what they, they, they missed it. Look, they weren't going to pay that price tag for Gordon Hayward. Let, let's just be honest. But, no, I, I agree completely with Jackie. I, I, I think uh, Jalen Brown, his narrative for All-Star, he came out the gate super strong. And another thing that coaches like, coaches like yeah. rewarding players that grow every single year, that get better every single year because they can see that player putting in the work. Because coaches have to game plan differently. They're like, last year we were able just to do this to slow Jalen Brown. And he keeps adding things to his game. That's why coaches elect him as an all-star game as an all-star player but let's also say this even though there's only one uh they're only one game under 500 there's only three teams in the eastern conference that are two games or more above 500 so they're kind of right in the middle of the pack when you look at comparing them to other teams in the eastern conference there's only three there so everybody else is basically where the boston celtics are are below Great point. Uh, you know, this team is one game under 500, but they can go on a three or four game winning streak and be a top four team in the East. Um, Tatum and Brown are one of the best young duos we have in this game. So I completely agree. They both definitely deserve to be an all-star. But Richard, you understand, you remember back when we played the dog days of the summer was that January time getting to all-star break because everyone was looking forward to a, 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 a break from your team, a little recovery, a little relaxation. Look for Boston to kind of do the same things, although Jackie pointed out they do have some holes. I think this short break will do them some good. And like I said, they're to a, you know, a four or five game winning streak out of being a third or fourth place team in the Eastern Conference. Let's not kid ourselves. Anybody is that kind of winning streak about being third or fourth in the Eastern Conference because there's only four teams over 500 still right now. Still <laughs> only four in the entire conference. Jackie, this is a problem. It's really it's been getting to me. I want to talk about the Mavericks, too, who like the Celtics a bit underachieving during the first half of the season. Last night, we were reminded why the expectations were initially so high for Dallas and Luka Doncic coming into this year. Now, one hurdle they will need to overcome is the 10 back-to-back -back games they have scheduled for the second half of the regular season. Take a look here. This is tied for second most. Given the injury concerns for Kristaps Porzingis, definitely something they are going to have to mitigate. Richard, do you expect the Mavs to be better in the second half, given especially this hurdle with the schedule that we just got today? Well, you don't want to say things can't get worse because always things can get worse. But if you look at the injuries, the the lack of the, the travel because of COVID that they had to deal with, players being stuck in certain places, you knew that they were going to get off to a slow start. And again, like Porzingis is not being at the level. And I think now they're kind of warming up into their season, which you see a lot of teams do. They didn't have the great offensive uh, efficiency that they had last year. But the entire league has jumped up offensively. So uh, I'm not surprised, uh, again, kind of similar to what Matt said about, hey, they're three or four games away from all of a sudden being right into the, okay, the Dallas Mavericks are back. So I'm not surprised. I think the expectations, people thought Luka was going to win the MVP, and they thought those numbers were going to be there and their team was going to continue to grow. It's just been a very slow growth so far this year. 
I, you know, I think you look at what Luca's done. I think he scored 30 something, 34 points a game over this six and one winning streak that they have. He's going to be fine. I don't worry about him. But if I am the Mavericks and I'm looking at this schedule, Rachel, that you've put up, I do have concerns about Porzingis because first it was the knee. He was coming off. He had to literally get in shape as the season began because of that short off season. Now there's some back stiffness. He's very important to them. He has been really a disaster defensively, which we're not used to with Porzingis. He yeah. was a, an elite defensive player for a part of the time with New York and last year with Dallas. Can he get back to that? Can he be a rim protector with all fighting his way through all these injuries? The other guy I think that's really hurt them that's been out has been Max Kleber. He, he was out, he was back in, now he's out again. So those are the questions I have also. You know, we've talked so much about the missing Seth Curry. If you watch that game last night, you say, Maybe Jalen Brunson could be Seth Curry. So that makes you feel a little better. But this this schedule to me is concerning because of those back-to-backs. And I can't imagine Porzingis playing a ton of back-to-backs. Hmm. This team had a lot of hype coming into the season after what they did in the bubble, uh, what Luka personally did in the bubble. So, you know, he was odds on favor to win the MVP. And we were all expecting a lot from Dallas. And like Richard said, it just didn't happen that way. But anytime you have Luka, you have a great chance. And this game is all about getting hot at the right time. Take, you know, case in point, the Miami Heat last year, you know, coming out of that fifth seed to make the finals. It's just about getting hot at the right time. The one concern, obviously, is KP and his ability to be able to play over the second half of the season. But I'm also interested to see what, they're, what they do before the trade deadline. Is there a piece they can pick up or a couple pieces they can pick up to strengthen that roster? But I think the key to this team's success in the second half is KP's ability to be on the floor and be effective. Yeah, you know what you know every night what Luca's going to give you now. Yeah, no interesting question. to bring that up about the trade deadline, Jackie. We've heard there's rumors out there that maybe the Mavs are even <clears> shopping <throat> right. for Zingas. Now, Mark Cuban has come out strongly denied those. Do you expect them to make some mm -hmm. kind of move before the deadline? I don't know about Porzingis. My, I think this is probably, uh, you know, semantics here. I doubt that they're shop, actively shopping Porzingis, but are they listening? We know one thing about Donnie Nelson. He's always listening to everybody. But I, I expect Porzingis to be with them going forward. Now, can they make another little move? Sure, and they probably should. We will be watching. It's going to be a good month. One month to the trade deadline that it, that starts tomorrow. The official sort of rumor season is going to open up. So, Jackie, we will be talking to you about a lot of these things in the coming weeks. Thank you so much you for bet. stopping by. We'll see you soon. Coming up next on this show, we're going to tell you why the path to a number one seed is a little clearer for the Nets after we crunch the numbers on their second half opponents. More schedule information coming up next. First, though, here's what the jump recommends for today. Kirk Goldsberry's NBA All-Star Mock Draft over on the ESPN Plus app. Who should LeBron and KD? So here are the teams with the toughest second half strength of schedule based on current opponent win percentage. Rockets are first. They have the toughest schedule left here in the second half, followed by the Wolves, Magic, Spurs, and Lakers. Richard, do you buy or sell the Lakers getting a top two seed with this schedule coming at them? Uh, I'm going to sell it. You know, I'm more concerned about the Rockets and Timberwolves. I think it's going to be a really tough stretch for them, you know, down the line. I'm just kidding. It doesn't matter for those two teams. You're, you're uh, yeah, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was the Lakers are going to see if you can sell it. No, the Lakers are going to struggle because they're going to deal with health and they want to be healthy there. So they're not. They're worried about the, being a top five. Um, I can't if, listen to anything else you said after if that. If any first team party. doesn't need a top two seed, it's the Lakers. If you're looking at a list of the teams with the most games after the All Star break, the Grizzlies and Spurs scheduled to play 4D games. The Mavs, Rockets, Wizards slated to play 38 games. Washington 11 and 18 right now. But hey, it's the East, so they're only two games out of a play-in spot. Matt, do you think their backloaded schedule will help or hurt their chances of getting into the playoffs? Because yeah, it's a lot of games, but it means they have a lot of at-bats too, a lot of games in hand. Right. I think it'll help. I mean, as a team, you want to always control your own destiny. You don't want to have to depend on other teams' wins or losses to dictate your future. So with 40 games, they have is 40 games to do it. Hopefully, they'll uh, be allowed to play all of them. But they'll be able to dictate their own narrative there and really, you know, have a chance to do it. Outside of San Antonio, all those teams are trying to fight to get to a playoff spot. So you want as many opportunities to get into those spots as you can. And I think those number of games are going to help all those teams that are on the fringe. And the Wizards have been playing great of late. So I, I'm excited to see, you know, get a little break and then finish. You want them to finish strong. Ultimately, I think what I, I think basketball fans should root for is the Washington Wizards to get that eighth spot 
or even uh, get the get the eighth spot and then either play against Philly. You know about the Joel Embiid, <laughs> and, the Joel Embiid and Russell Westbrook, or they get you know uh, the Brooklyn Nets. And again, there's a ton of fun things there, and you know that that's going to be a fiery series with James Harden and Kevin Durant. So I, I think I'm rooting for the Washington Wizards to get into that eighth spot just so we can see some really good um, you know one seed matchups. Yeah, and look, it could go either way. If you have a backloaded schedule, if you have more games at the back end. Injuries could kill you there. Guys could get just too tired. But for teams that haven't had practice time this season, and we've heard this over and over again from some of the coaching staffs, just having had more reps by the time you get to a greater percentage of your games could be an advantage. We've seen a lot of these teams that were kind of a disaster for the first month or two of the season starting to round into form now. We've been talking about the Mavericks on this show, the Wizards on this show. Those are teams that had big disrupt disruptions in the first part of the season, couldn't even practice or even meet in the same room because of COVID protocols. Now they're getting those reps in, so maybe being a little bit more backloaded, having a higher percentage of your games when you are a little more together will help them. We will have to see. Now, during the break, we showed you the teams with the toughest strength of schedule in the second half. That's, of course, based on current opponent winning percentages. Cannot predict the future. Uh, here are the teams with the easiest strength of schedule, though. The Jazz are first, followed by the Nets, Heat, Mavs, Celtics, and Sixers. So, Richard, the Nets have already been dominant in the first half of the season. This last couple weeks, they have looked so scary since trading for James Harden, especially... Now they have a, quote, easier schedule in the second half, strength of schedule-wise. What do you expect to see from them? I, I think they're still going to be figuring it out. I think they have a good, a, a good rhythm right now. I think they're still going to have some defensive things that they're still trying to navigate. You still have a first-time head coach. You're going to be adding Kevin Durant in. So they're going to be figuring out. They're still going to be great. But I want to give a compliment to everybody to the Utah Jazz. They have the easiest strength of schedule left. That means they had one of the more difficult yep. strength of schedules in the beginning, and they are the best team in the league, and they have been dominating the league. So they went through the hardest part of their schedule, dominated better than anybody else in the league. So I just want to give them a little bit of credit. That's amazing because you see it. There's nobody else that's even that close. So shout out to the Utah Jazz. I'm going to put a ton of respect on your name. That's impressive. I was not expecting to see that when that popped up on that graphic. But yeah, that's just me. I think Brooklyn will continue to build. You know, obviously strength of schedule. To, to me, one thing that scares me about the second easiest schedule is I know they're going to get hot. They're probably going to get the number one seed in the East, but the the the, the, the quality of competition, mm. is that going to prepare them for the playoffs? Obviously, I think their big three will be able to overcome that. But moving forward, what's the most important for me, uh, for Brooklyn, is strengthening that front line. Um, whether it's, you know, guys that are being bought out and bringing them in and really kind of getting some more depth on that front line because you look at once DeAndre Jordan goes down, Jeff Green's hurt now, KD's out, those are normally your backup fives. And although that's a benefit on the offensive end, it's a liability on the defensive end. So I'm looking for them to strengthen their front line moving forward. But I think that number one seed in the East is wide open now considering their strength of schedule. And uh, we're going to have to see how it plays out. Yeah, that buyout market is going to be crazy. Remember last season, we had the Lakers and Clippers really competing for guys almost just to make sure the guy didn't go to the other team. That was as important Otherwise as what he could do right. for your roster. I think this year we're going to see that again with the Lakers and Clippers, but you will also see the Nets joining that fray. Also, all three of those teams, they're championship contenders, but they have some needs, and I do think that's where you're going to see them try to fill it. The Nets will be an interesting case there, Matt, for sure. All right, coming up next, I will ask the guys how confident they are in these.